Um, mouse like precision, no aim assist. Uh, I'm Jim Smart, and we're looking into achieving mouse like precision uh, without aim assist with non mouse devices, probably mainly a controller. I know that's not in the title, but that's probably implied because we don't do aim assist with mouse. We need aim assist with a controller normally. So um, that's what we're going to do. This is going to be a very dense talk. We're going to try and hammer through it really fast. It's about an hour of content that I'm going to try and do in 40 minutes, so we have question time. Um, the slides will be available online. We'll try, I'll try and make them very easy to find. I want you to be able to go through them afterwards. And if you are skeptical about this kind of stuff, um, learn that this stuff is good, actually. If you are keen but don't know where to get started, that you have a basic platform to start from, that you know all the basics that you need to hit. And if you have the basics and you want to do really advanced stuff, this covers, makes a checklist for everything that you really need for that. So we're going to get into it. Um, this goes forward, that goes forward. Great, all right. Um, so I think we can all acknowledge that there's a disparity between standard controller controls and mouse controls in, for a lot of kinds of games. And we'd like to uh, close that gap. We'd like to deal with that disparity if possible. And it turns out that we pretty much can with good gyro controls. And good being the operative word here. Um, they're not always good. Uh, but even sloppy implementations still offer a lot of advantages. Uh, gyro controls is just another name for motion controls. Motion is a bit broader. Um, and I like gyro because it kind of dodges a little bit that stigma that we have against gyro controls of like waving things around and then waiting for things to happen and hoping that they're recognized. In the same way that if you ever played black and white on the PC and you like do a spell by drawing the letter R or a swirl with your mouse, um, that's really rough. Isn't it a good thing that that didn't put us off mouse aiming? So don't let waggling motion controls put you off gyro aiming. Gyro is really a mouse-like input. All right, um, so I'm an input specialist based in Perth, probably the foremost expert in gyro controls, at least as far as the gyro gaming community is concerned. Um, I didn't come up with gyro controls in the first place. I owe a lot to the Wii U's Splatoon for coming out in 2015 and saying, look, you can do a lot of your aiming with modern motion sensors. And I owe a lot to Steam for saying, look, here, just map your gyro input to mouse and play with gyro controls, good, solid, tight gyro controls in any game on your PC. So um, in 2018, I set out to make my own input remapper so I could learn how all this stuff works, um, so I can figure out some good standards that I can show to other developers, and then hopefully developers will put, put these in their games, and then I get to enjoy sweet controls in your games. Um, and that has worked slowly. I, so I made this input remapper called Joyshock Mapper. Um, it's open source. It, it has the best gyro control options of any remapper out there. There are other reasons to use other remappers. They're easier to use in a lot of ways. But when it comes to gyro controls, Joyshock Mapper is still king. And it's also the first place, um, the first program that ever had flick stick. Has anyone heard of flick stick controls? There we go, two. That's more than I was expecting. Um, awesome, sweet, OK. So I made that. I put it in Joyshock Mapper. Um, now it's in a few games. Um, and I got to put it in a few games myself, actually, in a couple of games myself. Um, I made this 3D overlay that you see. I made GyroWiki, uh, which is where I put resources online uh, to teach people how to do this stuff. I made the overlay that you see there uh, to help me make YouTube videos so that I can show this stuff off. Got an open source um, header library for helping you with your motion controls. And I'm a freelance input specialist. Most of my work isn't actually in gyro controls, but if you're, in gyro, if you're interested in gyro controls, I'm normally the person you go to. I, did Fortnite's update um, in February, I worked on Deathloop. They did their update two weeks ago. Uh, House of the Dead remake has very good gyro controls, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> and Severed Steel has an update coming out very soon with uh, what looks to be really good gyro controls. I've been able to be a bit involved there. And when Deathloop's gyro controls were released two weeks ago, someone on the PS5 subreddit asked, how good is its gyro on a scale of one to Fortnite? And they were satisfied when someone else answered, Jib helped them. So hopefully I'm the right person to give this talk. <laughs> Fortnite's the only game I know of that will hit all the points in this uh, presentation. You don't have to hit all the points here to have good gyro controls. Oh, and also, I'm not here on behalf of any of those developers. Um, I'm just here representing my own work and experience as an expert in this space. We will use those games as examples, though. So, Gyro is short for gyroscope. It's a, um, a motion sensor in just about every modern controller. I don't really call Xbox controllers modern controllers, sorry. Um, because it's in all the others. 
It just measures angular velocity in three axes. How fast is the controller pitching? I drove my controller on hand. How, how fast is it pitching, yawing, rolling? Uh, instantaneous velocity measured very precisely. It's just local. It doesn't know if it's upside down or whatever, and that's fine. And it's often reporting at 200 hertz or higher. 250 in a PS4 controller, 200 in a Switch controller. Um, so you can expect really good, accurate results from it. Uh, there's a little bit of noise there, but it's less than player hand shakiness. So if you can deal with player hand shakiness, you don't even have to deal with the, with the noise in gyro input. Motion sensors in modern controllers also have accelerometers. We're mostly not going to deal with it. You don't have to worry about accelerometers when you're doing your gyro controls. We will touch on it a bit in one of the advanced options. So your basic gyro control, but your basic gyro aiming implementation looks like this. This is side by side with your basic mouse aiming implementation. It's that simple. No dead zones, no processing, no nothing. And with a sensitivity slider that goes high enough, this is actually a great gyro aiming implementation for a lot of players. In fact, what stops a lot of games from having good gyro controls is that their sensitivity slider doesn't go high enough. We'll get to that a bit later. But it's really simple, actually, to have good gyro controls. Um, but if you haven't really seen it in action before, this is Fortnite. Um, that's my 3D overlay. I made a generic controller for the Fortnite video so that we could show it on PlayStation and on Switch. Um, and it's a very accurate representation of what the controller is doing. If the controller vibrates, the motion sensors pick it up. If it's HD, rumble, whatever, going at 60 hertz or higher, you need a high refresh rate monitor to see it, but you can see it. The motion sensor is that good. Um, so I can just turn the control to the left, turn it to the right, and the camera follows as I do it. I can pitch it up and down, and the camera follows the same action. So the gyro is a mouse. The camera instantly and continuously follows your movement. Whereas with stick aiming, you are indicating a direction you want to turn and how fast. But with both mouse and gyro, you are just doing the action yourself, and the game does it with you. Thumbsticks are indirect, they are telling. Uh, mouse and gyro are direct, they are doing. And it's the same for moving a cursor around the screen. Using remappers like Steam and Joystick Mapper, people use gyro controls to play MOBAs, RTSs, point-and-click adventure games, rhythm games, anything that thumbsticks aren't good at. As a rule of thumb, if it's better with a mouse, it's better with a gyro. But gyro also has the added bonus that you're still holding a full controller. It's not taking your thumbs off any of the thumbsticks or any of the buttons. It just adds on top of everything you're already doing, including traditional stick aiming. Um, and you'll notice that I do use the example of a full stand controller on a TV here. That's the way most people are going to play it. It also works on handheld. It's a little bit less good on handheld. Some people expect it to be better on handheld, more like an AR experience. It's a little bit less good because the screen's moving as you're moving it, but it's still great. It's still worth doing. And uh, some players really like playing with a single Joy-Con. It feels almost like you have a laser pointer in your hand. But you do get more stability with two hands, so don't sleep on two-handed controller gyro. Um, players typically start with the close enough process. In fact, everyone, pretty much everyone, will play with their gyro controls with the close enough process, whether they're a first-timer or they're super experienced. And the close enough process is this, uh, that you will, with your ticks, with your sticks, get your aim close enough that you can take over with gyro. They make the small, small adjustments with your hands to line up a target, turn a body shot into a headshot, quickly adjust to any movement. Um, that's it. Pretty much everyone plays this way. Experienced stick players are really good at getting close enough. In one movement, they'll get their um, aimer pretty much on target. And so their close enough starts very small. Uh, it would be reluctant to do much with the gyro. Um, Fighting some, mes some muscle memory here. It's kind of a more intentional thing for experienced stick players to pick up gyro controls. But putting in the practice, their close enough range widens, um, and using the gyro on top of stick aiming becomes instinctive as well. Inexperienced stick players pick up gyro controls really quickly. Their close enough range is wise, uh, wide because stick aiming is hard. It's clunky. They don't get close to the target very easily. But Gyro is really natural to them. Um, just put it in, your ha in their hands and see what they do with it. It's pretty cool. Um, with practice, everyone tends to increase their sensitivity over time, widen their range over time. And uh, for some players, everywhere is close enough. Some players will put their sensitivity high and will not touch the right stick at all or will map it to non-gyro things, um, map it to non-camera things. Most players won't get there, and that's fine. As soon as you're getting some advantage out of using gyro sometimes, it's worth it, because having gyro controls doesn't subtract anything from the controller experience. 
but um, some players will also just, it'll dictate their entire experience. Um, it's worth trying it yourself, trying to get comfortable with yourself, even trying to enjoy it yourself. Uh, I think that's probably an advantage that I have over with approaching gyro controls over a lot of other game developers. And uh, it's very easy to try yourself these days in Fortnite. It is free and on pretty much every platform. It's the only thing that hits every point up here. I'm pretty pleased with how the controls are there. The gyro gaming community is as well. Um, and there, I know it's a competitive game. Maybe you don't want to throw yourself into a competitive game, but they also have player-made maps for aim training and so on. Um, Death Loop, slow-paced stealth, great for learning controls like that. And uh, they released their update two weeks ago. Um, Splatoon 3 is on Switch as of a month ago. Um, it's built around gyro controls. Historically, Splatoon games, a majority of their players play with gyro controls the whole time, especially at the competitive level. And their single player is basically just training. Here's how to learn um, gyro controls while having a good time doing it. But there are a lot of other good games to try out as well. Uh, more and more players are starting to prefer gyro controls, saying they're more fun, more comfortable than, than playing with a mouse, but more powerful than playing with a legacy controller, and can have a huge impact on what games they buy and play. And since more players are preferring to play this way, you should have good gyro controls. You'll find it's really easy to do in any game that benefits from a mouse at all, and teach and encourage your players to give it a go. Have it on by default, have tutorials that show them how to do that. I know that's a big ask. I know on by default is a bit scary, but here's the thing. If you teach them to like gyro controls, and there aren't many games with good gyro controls out there, they now have a big reason to prefer your game's controls over other games' controls. Your game now has distinctively good controls. And when was the last time we could say a game has distinctively good controls? But for people who like gyro, Fortnite is in a league of its own. No other battle royale compares. Um, there are a few other games with good gyro controls as well, more than a few other games. There are games with kind of rubbish gyro controls, but for people who like gyro controls, it's still better than stick-only aiming. Games like Call of Duty just aren't even in the picture. They're not even participating. Apex Legends is there sort of on Switch, but it's not on PlayStation or on PC. Why? Um, gyro controls make your game better for a growing class of people. So yeah, you have gyro controls on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5. Switch is basically expected. It's on mobile. It's on PC. Anything's possible, right? If you're a PlayStation partner, yeah, you probably have access to their tools to also provide PlayStation controller support, including gyro on PC. Um, Steam input, if your game's on Steam, gives you accelerometer, gyro, orientation for DualShock 4, DualSense, you see them all there. Even Steam controller and Steam Deck, it's pretty awesome. And SDL2 is a very popular uh, open source input library that already has motion control support for PlayStation and Switch controllers. Um, I had a little bit of involvement with that. Being cross-platform and vendor agnostic is you're not tied to one, you're not tied to Steam, you know, you still have gyro controls if you release on Epic Game Store, for example or anywhere else on itch, um, you might already be using it for your input. Uh, it doesn't have all the features that the other libraries do, and that's what my library Gamepad Motion Helpers is for. It's a single header, uh, it's a header only open source library that just provides calibration and stuff like that. So we have five concerns that we want to address to make good gyro controls. Feel, orientation, sensitivity, steadying, and positioning. And we're gonna do a basic first pass through all of these. How do we address these really simply? And then we're going to do an advanced one. Hopefully we're gonna have time for everything there. Um, let's see how we go with that. So starting with feel, a gyro is a mouse, direct control over the camera and cursor. Uh, and a mouse gives you a really good um, account of how it was moved from frame to frame. So with gyro, we also wanna give a good account of how it was moved since the last frame. You want to honor all movement without compromise. And this means gathering as many gyro inputs as possible. Like I said before, the gyros are reporting at 200 hertz or higher. Your game's not playing at 200 hertz or higher, but you can get all of those inputs. Um, we also want to minimize auto calibration. It can just make, I'll explain it in a bit, but it makes your controls feel bad. Um, we don't want to apply any aim assist and we don't want to do any additional processing unless we make it optional. There's some good things to do and we'll even make, set some defaults some default processing on top of this, but they must be optional because many players are served, best served by our bare bones implementation we had earlier. Nothing else added onto it. Let's unpack this a bit more. Um, okay, so first we're gathering as many gyro inputs as possible. If you only get the latest gyro input each frame, the quality of your gyro controls is tied to your game's performance. 
and players feel it. Um, instead, gather multiple gyro inputs. This is really easy to do. Uh, you can have a fixed a thread doing fixed rate polling separately. Uh, but if you're on console, you can very easily just request multiple samples per frame. Um, PlayStation and Switch do allow you to do this. If you can't find it, ask me. I'll get you there. Um, and then once you have all those new samples, all you have to do is average them together. A gyro input is a, is a vector of floats, essentially. Um, if you're getting multiple inputs per frame, just get the average of all of those, add them all together, divide by the number of them, and that will give you a better representation of the movement that has happened in that frame. Uh, games that do this include Fortnite, Deathloop, CSGO, House of the Dead, Remake, uh, Zombie Death Quota, others as well. I just can't fit them all here. But um, yeah. The next thing is to minimize auto calibration. This is actually something that you don't have to deal with directly for the most part, but Auto calibration is, or bias correction or zero drift, the gyro sensor itself doesn't know when it's at zero. It has to be told when it's at zero. And platform providers and systems basically handle this for you and go, oh, it looks like the control is being held still. You know, the accelerometer is not getting much variation in its input. The gyro input seems really steady. Maybe the player is not moving the controller. And so we will set this as the new zero. But that feels really bad when it happens while you're aiming, say at a slow or steady, slow or distant target that's far away. Um, and so you want to minimize those kinds of interruptions. So um, some platforms do let you configure how easily this happens. If the platform doesn't let you configure that, they're usually already pretty well tuned for fine aiming anyway, so you don't have to worry about it. But um, if you're on Switch, there's a function that you should call to tighten up the auto cal calibration. I made a post in the forums uh, with details on that, and you can look out for that. Ask me if you can't find it. Um, yeah. Sorry, this is such a vague slide. Other slides aren't going to be as vague, but this is platform specifics, NDAs. Uh, you know, just talk to me about it afterwards if you're not sure. Uh, manual calibration is also an option. No game does it yet. Let's talk about it another time, I reckon. Um, the other, so. The next big thing for feel is no aim assist. And that's kind of like part of the topic of this whole talk. You know, mouse light controls, no aim assist. The gyro is a mouse. It doesn't need aim assist. It make, aim assist makes your tracking overpowered. It makes your target acquisition overpowered. And in fact, it feels worse, even if it makes you pl play better, because the movement feels less connected to what you're actually doing in, in real life. Um, for non-competitive games, the overpowered aspect maybe doesn't really matter to you but uh, at least disable it by default so that players don't find that your gyro controls feel bad, feel like they're you know, not actually responding to the player's movement, to the player's movement correctly. Um, one way to do this, because you want your aim assist on by default for stick-only players, but off by default for gyro players is, I guess, to have a gyro aim assist option where you can separate the impact between gyro and not. Or in Fortnite, we have it so that um, aim assist is just disabled when you have yeah, when gyro is active. Even if it's only active while you're aiming down sights, for example, uh, aim assist will be disabled, and then when you uh, release the left trigger and you no longer aim down sights, you're firing from the hip and gyro is no longer active, aim assist will be active again, so you still get that real stickiness for um, shotgunning people in the face in the box. Um, so a quick case study, House of the Dead remake, modern remake of a classic light gun game. One of those games where you point your gun at a screen, doesn't work on modern screens, doesn't work with modern controllers, but they use gyro controls to really get the feel of that. And so a re there's a really high bar for light gun games, the kind of accuracy, accuracy and precision you expect from controls like these. The launch version of the game, it came out in April, was um, really well re researched and in great settings, but lacked this, this kind of hidden knowledge about high sampling rates, uh, minimizing auto calibration, aim assist, and so on. And so the feel just didn't quite meet expectations players had for a game like this. Um, I reached out to them, uh, got to be a little bit involved, and we improved the feel of the gyro controls by gathering more gyro samples, tightening the auto calibration, and disabling aim, aim assist on gyro input. And it really made a dramatic difference. Um, that ad update came out in July, I think, so if you haven't played the Switch version of the game, since then, to give it another go. There was other cool stuff in that update as well. And the last thing for feel is uh, that we want no additional processing. 
That's it, just nothing, or at least nothing forced on the player. You wouldn't force any filtering on mouse controls, so don't do it with gyro. There are some great options out there, as I mentioned before, even great defaults. They can improve the experience for some players, but they'll make the experience worse for others. Don't make players think gyro is imprecise, sloppy, or unpredictable by forcing settings on them that they won't like, or that they might not like. And I say this not because of my long history with gyro controls, which is really only half a decade, but because of our much longer uh, history as an industry with mouse controls. You wouldn't do anything to your mouse controls, really, uh, without making it optional. Um, we know better, and uh, we should know better with gyro as well. Well, now we do in this room, don't we? Um, so that's everything for feel. That's kind of like what's fundamental. It doesn't vary from player to player, device to device, game to game. It's just two things you do and two categories of things you don't do. Um, so hopefully that is doable or not doable. Um, now, our last four topics, which is going to take the rest of our time, orientation, sensitivity, steadying, and repositioning, they're all optionals. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all, just like mouse sensitivity, mouse acceleration. So let's get into those. Which gyro axes control which camera cursor, camera slash cursor axes? That's the orientation question. Cameras are typically only yaw and pitch. They don't really roll in your game. You're only controlling two axes there. Um, cursor movement as well, it's just horizontal and vertical. You know, you're just doing a 2D action. Uh, so use your controllers, local yaw and local pitch, angular velocities accordingly. Just imagine your controller has a laser pointer sticking out the front of it. How would you move it to make the laser pointer move left or right, up or down? That's the axis that you want to use by default in the game. And that is, you've seen this three times now, but that's how you do it. Um, but there is a challenge here. Some players do hold their controllers differently. Sometimes I hear people have come to me and gone, how come your gyro controls are using the wrong axis by default? And we do a bit of invest investigating and it turns out they hold their controller like this. A lot of players do, they're leaning back it's sitting up like this between them and the TV, and so they want to turn it like this. It's still left and right. It's still their local yaw. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that, right? So it's good to provide them the option. The flat orientation should be your default. The upper right should be another option. Um, and some games have taught players to lean their controllers side to side. It's not very natural, but some players come in used to it. So if you're already supporting the roll axis, let players invert it so that they can lean side to side as well. But um, yeah, that covers that. Oh, it's a bit different for handheld. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna call this your, because you've got your screen facing you. So even though the controller is now upright, this is your screen your, and this is the most natural because it's matching the axis that the camera's moving, turning at in game. Um, it is most natural, but it, means the screen turns away from you and that can kind of make aiming awkward. Um, screen roll keeps the screen facing you, but it is less natural. But a lot of mobile games do that, so um, players have gotten used to that. And uh, there's no harm in having both at the same time. Just add them together. So you're going to have a your, a your angular velocity. A Actually, I'm going to go back to... Just to explain that. Gyro delta dot your in brackets plus gyro delta dot roll close bracket time sensitivity. There's no fancy transformations or anything like that. You're just adding the two axis inputs together. Um, it works very simply. Some players might find that they dislike getting some interference from their less dominant axis from unintended movement, and that's fine. You let players disable and invert individual axes. Fortnite puts it like this. For each axis, is it standard, disabled, or inverted? All right, let's get to sensitivity. We talked about making sure sensitivity is high enough. In 3D games, if you're controlling the camera, there is one true sensitivity. And we're not used to that, right? In uh, mouse and stick, games have different sensitivity scales. Some games have the same sensitivity scale, but there's still some arbitrary number in the background being multiplied by it all. The numbers don't mean anything to the player, except that if you double the number, you double the sensitivity, and that's about it. But with gyro controls, there really is one true sensitivity, the natural sensitivity scale, and it is this. One means the camera turns the same amount as the controller. So if I do a 45 degree turn with my controller, the 
camera is going to turn 45 degrees at the same time. Simple, right? 10 means the camera turns 10 times as much as the controller. And that's why I have this little graphic here. You can do a 180 by only rotating the controller 18 degrees. And yes, players do go this high and higher. No, most games don't let players go this high. Um, so, we'll get, that, we'll, be, we'll get back to that. Um, why use the natural scale? It's not actually make or break. As long as your range is wide enough, people can find a sensitivity they like, but it's easy for players to understand. Many players already know the sensitivity they like. Have you seen those converters, the mouse sensitivity converters between games? Put in your game, your sensitivity, another game you want to play, trying to get the same sensitivity between them. Just use the natural scale for gyro. It's just, it just makes sense. Um, it shows you've done your research because it's the kind of thing that's obvious in retrospect, but almost no games do it. And so that's one of the, I, I think, a great example of, a, of good design where it feels obvious when you know about it. Um, so anyway, the fact that you've done it at all it shouldn't be distinctive, it is distinctive, it shows you've done your research. And even if you don't end up using the number, it helps us answer how high should the scale go. We can talk, still talk about this number even if you don't end up using it. So the scale should go up to 20, in my opinion. I used to recommend 10, and then it wasn't high enough for some players. There's no reason for the scale not to go high enough, so I go 20. Many games only go up to about two. So as you can imagine, this isn't a very comfortable experience for players who like to go higher. The most most of the skilled players I know like between three and five. They're really being held back by games that only stop at two. Um, and a few high skilled players I know like between eight and 12. You want nice small increments on that slider as well. On the lower sensitivities, the difference between one and 1.1 is a big difference. So uh, increments of 0 0.1 or finer are pretty important. That's what I recommend. And so examples of games using the Natural scale and having enough range are Fortnite going up to 20, Boomerang X going up to 10. I hadn't bumped up my recommendation yet. And Deathloop goes up to 200. They don't have decimal points in their menu, in their settings. So they've just gone natural times 10. And this means that they can still go in increments of 0 0.1. So I thought that was a good solution, even if it's less obvious to players. Um, <clears throat> what about 2D games, screen space, cursor control? Is there a one true scale there? There isn't that I know of. If you come up with it, let me know. Um, I'd love to know. And without having a one-two scale, it's hard to kind of like talk about what your range should actually be. Just give the player much more range than they need. Just with some rough rounding and calculation from our 3D games to a 2D space, why not give them like a full screen width cursor movement in five degrees of control and turning at your, maybe around your max scale, max setting. Um, and then a common thing in a lot of games is to have separate X and Y um, horizontal and vertical sensitivities. Already very common with stick and mouse, S-grade with gyro as well. Perfectly acceptable. I'm just going to throw out there that a ratio slider can be handy. This is what Fortnite does because people are going to figure out their ratio very quickly and adjust their sensitivity over time. And you don't want them, if they're not doing the one-to-one -one ratio, it's annoying to have to pull out your calculator to keep the ratio when you're adjusting your sensitivity. So this is how Fortnite does it. Um, it's worth checking out. This is only how Fortnite does it with gyro controls, because that's the only part I was involved in. Um, all right, steadying. We also want to deal with unintended movement. And this is the one downside of the gyro being essentially a frictionless mouse, is you got shaky hands. I've got shaky hands. Um, a common strategy, by the way, for players getting started with that is to rest the controller in your lap while you're playing. It gives you some support. But still, it's going to take some practice to not have your controller bump around with each shot um, and to avoid some shakiness. The, as you get more comfortable, you will be able to bump up your sensitivity. But um, handshakiness does make it hard to hit small or distant targets. And it can also cause some players to feel some discomfort, some motion sickness, just having gyro controls on at all when the camera's moving a little bit with unintended movements. So we want to try and filter those out and squeeze them down. Common solutions include a dead zone or a minimum turn threshold, um, but it makes fine aiming harder. I think. Some players do like the option, but I'll, I'll make that a last resort. Uh, some games do some smoothing, but it that just takes longer to consume the input and makes your movements feel laggy. So we can fix that, and we will in the advanced section if we get to that. Um, but your best bang for buck is something I call tightening. Um, in CSGO, they added it and called it a precision zone. Um, 
it doesn't ignore any input. There's no lag. It's extremely simple, and it looks like this. Going to have to look at some code here. Um, so you can see there's a tightening threshold that's going to be a setting the player has, and if your input speed is less than that threshold, you know, I, I wrote my explanation for that. It's going to be much quicker. All we're doing here is adding a non-linear linear response to inputs below that threshold, slower than that threshold. So if your input speed is half of that threshold, it's going to be halved again. It's going to be reduced to a quarter of that threshold. If it's close to zero, it's going to be made extremely close to zero. And if it's close to that threshold, it's only going to be re reduced a little bit. And so there are no discontinuities. There are no input ignored. Um, it's just a small kind of deceleration curve, I guess, or steep acceleration curve um, that connects neatly at the threshold with just having a, a constant sensitivity thereafter. Um, it does a lot to make your controls feel a lot tighter. And it's really simple. It's essentially one line of logic here. Um, so it's definitely worth doing. I just present it to the user as a threshold, degrees per second is what Fortnite does, with a default of five degrees per second. That was also the default in Joyshock Mapper. Uh, that's also the default I've recommended to others. The more I've been involved with other companies, we've um, done a lot of testing. I try to avoid my defaults so that we can test other ideas better, and we end up at the same default. So um, start from five. It must go all the way down to zero, though, because some players don't need it. Um, and, and finally, in the basic section, uh, we have repositioning. If your mouse gets to the edge of your mouse pad and you want to keep going, you pick it up and you put it in the center or something, right? If your controller is at the edge of your comfortable range and you want to keep going, you disable the gyro and reposition it. Simple as that. But you need a way to disable the gyro. Some games do this very naturally. Think Breath of the Wild, where you're, the, gyro, the motion controls are only ever active while you are drawing your bow or while you're preparing to throw a weapon. So most of the time, you don't actually have to think about how you're holding the controller, how you're moving the controller. It's only when you're actually aiming at something that you have to do that. And so you don't really need an additional way to disable the gyro there, because you can always come out of the aim mode and then enter back in pretty easily. Funnily enough, there are a lot of games that fall under this category that match this kind of design pattern as if they were made for gyro controls, but they just don't have gyro controls. These kind of games would be extremely easy, both from a developer point of view and for players picking them up, to learn gyro controls. Um, so let's do it. Um, some games do have a dedicated aim button, but still a lot of aiming and firing happens from the hip. Um, have an option to have gyro only active while aiming down sights but also always on. Fortnite, Deathloop, Boomerang X, Rogue Company, and Severed Steel do this. Um, and some games, of course, have no aim, no aim button. Call these always aiming games like Splatoon, CSGO, Quake, Overwatch. So if gyro is always on in games like these, um, please provide ways to disable it temporarily. This is, gonna be, this is actually the single hardest thing for integrating into your game because everything else um, kind of happens orthogonally to what your game does. It doesn't impact your other controls or anything like that. But having a way to disable the gyro is going to impact your controls, isn't it? I mean, a simple way that doesn't really impact your controls is to have the option to have gyro disabled while you engage the right stick or the look stick, whichever one it is. Um, Overwatch on Switch and Fortnite both provide this option. Uh, but the most powerful option is a binding, a button that can disable the gyro while held. Fortnite. Boomerang X and House of the Dead do this. Um, in all those games, it's not there by default. The player can choose to bind it, and then they just get a better um, gyro aiming experience. And players have learned to look for this option. Um, by the best, I really mean it's the most powerful. Not everyone's going to choose that option, but it is by far the most versatile option, because it's, it's the closest analog you have to picking your mouse up off the mouse pad. So even if you can't find room on your controller, give players the option to bind it. Um, and it can be combined with other inputs, like a short press versus a long press. So these are Fortnite's options. You have reset camera. We'll get into that. Gyro modifier is the gyro off button. And you can combine the gyro modifier with, um, with other actions, where the other action happens in a short press, and the gyro modifier happens in a long press. The gyro is disabled on a long press. But it doesn't wait for the long press. It's Disabling the gyro very briefly doing a short press is not very destructive at all to your experience. But having to wait for the long press for gyro to be disabled um, 
is, is distracting from your experience. So there's no need to wait for the long press. There are a bunch of different ways you could try and fit it in. Uh, the Jira Gaming community will have lots of ideas if you want to join the Discord, because they're already used to entering these games that using input remappers like Steam or Joyshook Mapper or others, and um, playing these games that already have patched controller layouts and figuring out somewhere to put their Jira off button. For example, the touchpad touch, um, a lot of people will use that because a lot of games aren't using touchpad touch on PlayStation 4 or 5 to actually do anything. Um, it's a little bit out of the way, but it's not already being used, probably. So to have gyro enabled or disabled while you touch that as an option is really good. All right. Um, some games have a reset camera button, Splatoon, Rogue Company, Overwatch. It just, you press the button and it resets your view vertically. Um, it's strictly less useful than a gyro off button. So it's a good option to have, but if you have it, don't think that it means you don't need a gyro off button. Reset camera is great if your, if your point of interest is in front of you and you're not trying to correct your position horizontally. That's about it. It can be improved by making it so that holding the button disables gyro, but still, it, for the vertical repositioning, it's better to have a gyro off button. Um, all right. This is your checklist from the basics. You'll want to hit hopefully all of these. But um, in the time left, I do want to touch on some of the advanced stuff. There are some novel things there that I do want to hit. So let's go for that. I'm going to wait until you take that picture, no rush. Uh, these slides are going to be online. Um, okay, advanced version of feel, we don't have to do anything. We covered everything in the basics, nothing is optional. So that's quick, right? Orientation. So, <sighs> the local space gyro, mapping just the local yaw axis to, um, to camera yaw is very inflexible. If you're playing a game with a lot of verticality, um, and you end up with your controller pointing up, doing this to turn the camera left and right feels awkward and difficult. So um, it wouldn't be nice if it was adaptive. And so as you transitioned to that, it, it started using the roll axis instead. Um, in fact, there are ways to do this. We can tell by looking at someone's controller, oh, they're a flat player, they're an upright player. And obviously the motion sensors can do this as well. So let's do that ourselves. The, uh, this will broadly fall under category of world space gyro. What's your controller's orientation with respect to the world rather than just its changes with respect to itself? So we're going to get gravity. Get gravity. We'll, we'll, there are ways to get gravity. Um, <coughs> gravity gives you the up direction. And to get your yaw rotation, your yaw angular velocity around the up vector, it's just a dot product of your whole gyro input with the up vector. That's just what the dot product does with a normalized up vector. So that's pretty sweet, that's pretty simple. That gives us your left, right velocity, thank you. Um, pitch axis, you can just use the pitch axis, the local pitch axis, Breath of the Wild does this, Splatoon 2 used to do this, or you can project the local pitch axis onto the gravity plane, a little more complex. We're not gonna spend much time on, on world space gyro because we are gonna do better than that. It is intuitive for flat and upright, it is adaptive it's not good on handheld because players also like to lie back in their bed and play like this. Um, don't use world space for handheld. It's a complaint some people have about Splatoon. Um, skip over the gravity stuff. Except to say that your gravity calculation is going to be imperfect and the degree to which it is imperfect, it makes your world space gyro calculations imperfect. Um, if you're five degrees off, your gravity vector is five degrees off, your world space gyro input is going to be five degrees off. And that kind of sucks. It's not fun to introduce that kind of inaccuracy. Um, and you're never qu quite going to get perfect with that gravity calculation. So um, I've got something called player space gyro. It has all the intuitiveness and adaptability of world space. Um, none of the error of world space. Uh, even with a really crude gravity calculation. And so it simplifies the world space quite a bit because you can go with a really, really basic four-liner gravity calculation and you're going to get good results from this. And it's pretty simple to implement. I'm going to try do it quickly. Um, the gist is that uh, we trust the magnitude of the player's combined your role rotation. It doesn't matter if the player is slightly out of axis. If they're doing this, they probably mean, if they do this 45 degrees, they're probably meant to do that 45 degrees. 
If they do this 45 degrees, they're probably meant to do that 45 degrees. It doesn't matter strictly what the axis is in. If we care too much about is it rotating around the right axis, we lose some of that information. So we just get the magnitude, but the magnitude is a positive number. It doesn't tell us if it's rotating left or right. So our weld your calculation did give us a signed number. It gave us left or right. We just use the sign from weld your to give us the direction for our uh, player space your rotation. You see how we use the magnitude there uh, multiplied by the sign from world your. And we've changed the sign, we've, we've changed the uh, world your calculation there. It is still a dot product, but we've removed pitch from the equation. And by removing pitch from the equation, there is no cross contamination between axes. And there's no intentional input loss due to gravity error or player error because we're trusting that the player is doing reasonable things with their controller. But that seems a bit silly, doesn't it? To trust the player is going to do reasonable things with their controller. So we are going to filter out very out-of-axis rotations. Constraints teach the player how it's meant to be used. So we're going to trust roll or yaw when that rotation is near the world space rotation axis and clamp it out when it's out of, out of that axis. Um, I'm going to skip over this, actually, because there's other stuff that we need to cover. This is detailed on GyroWiki, and there's going to be a link as well, and there's going to be slides. Yeah, we're going to have to skip through some stuff. But the takeaway is use local space when you're in handheld, use player space when you're on controller. Here's a quick and dirty gravity calculation as well. It's a four-liner with one vector of state. It's very simple. Um, we can come back to that another time. For advanced sensitivity, a lot of games reduce do zoom scaling. They reduce the sensitivity as you zoom in so that you're not, so that you know you can keep in control on like a 10 times or 20 times sniper scope. Um, that's nothing new here. The only question related to gyro is doesn't this mess with natural sensitivity? Yes, it does. So just use natural natural sensitivity at your base field of view and uh, scale down when you're zooming in further than that. But uh, having this option is really useful if you can zoom in very far. Fortnite has this enabled by default and you can disable it. And um, another advanced option for sensitivity is acceleration. And with sticks, acceleration is usually something that happens over time. With mouse, acceleration is instantaneous. It's just a nonlinear response to the size of your input. And so it's the same with gyro. The easiest way to present it, in my opinion, to players is as having two different sensitivities, one for your slow movements, one for your quick flicks. And that sort of caps off that sensitivity ramp that mouse often has. Um, so that your flicks are consistent. It's easy to gain that muscle memory for big turns. You have two thresholds, a slow threshold and a fast threshold. And um, when you're, the size of your input is between those, you'll interpolate between the small sensitivity and the large sensitivity. In terms of presenting this to the user, showing them a second sensitivity is tricky when you have different X and Y sensitivities. And we also don't want them to be able to set a sensitivity lower than their low sensitivity for their high sensitivity. So I like to present it as a fast multiplier. The minimum value is one, no acceleration. How fast do you want your high sensitivity to be compared to your low sensitivity? Goodness gracious, the time. OK. Um, <laughs> steadying. A lot of games will do some smoothing. Smoothing adds lag. I have a solution for that. It's something called soft-tiered smoothing. And it's not even a smoothing algorithm. It's just a filter for your smoothing algorithm that distributes your input between um, smooth, smooth input for small inputs and raw input for large inputs. If there was a hard threshold there for distributing between them, it can actually amplify noise at, in, in some cases. So you want a nice soft transition there. Um, and I'll just show an example of how that works. You've got your raw input here on the blue line and you've got your smooth input on the red. That's the same input going in there. And you can see how it steadies out that uh, noisy input at the bottom but it also draws out that big movement and adds some lag to it that we don't really like. Um, it reduces noise. It preserves displacement perfectly, which tightening doesn't do, but it feels laggy on big moves. I hope you can see that yellow line. It's a bit hard to. That's soft-tiered smoothing filter added on top of that. It smooths out the uh, noisy input at the bottom in the same way, but it 100% respects the big movement as well. It has none of that input lag. So it'll be worth going back to look at that, the algorithm that's there. It's like five lines to just choose between the smoothing that you might already be doing and not smoothing at all. 
But um, one important feature there is that even when all your imp you're way over the threshold, you're not smoothing any more input, you're still consuming the old smoothed input so that um, that gets out of your um, memory. Um, how are we doing? All right. A high rate gyro controller, uh, gyro sensor accur accurately picks up vibration. Low rate gyro doesn't, but it gets awful interference patterns that you can't actually filter out. So you definitely want that high sampling rate on your gyro. Um, this, can, this can be uncomfortable for some players. Um, a very easy way to, and because of the magnitude of the vibration, even though it's really small in size, it's very high in velocity, it gets out of the range of all of our thresholds for tightening or for soft tiered smoothing. And so those just don't work with filtering out vibration. A simple two frame moving average <coughs> smoothing helps. It just means like average your gyro input between this frame and the last frame if you have vibration enabled. You can make a setting for it, Fortnite has a setting for it, and it's automatically disabled if vibration is also turned off. But it's such a small amount of smoothing that um, it doesn't really introduce much lag. And then advanced gyro players, the reason Fortnite's gyro off button is called a gyro modifier is because players can change what it actually does. They can set per axis, is it going to disable gyro or will it enable gyro? or invert your input. So just as an option to consider, some players like to invert their gyro. It means I get to the edge of my range, I start pressing a button, and I can keep turning left by turning right. And I get to the edge of my range, and I release the button, and I can keep turning left by turning left. And you can turn infinitely like that. And it's hard to do, but players like to do it. Some players do. And it means it like totally removes the limits of gyro aiming in terms of the space available in front of you. And it will work pretty well on mouse too for players who are keen on that. So it's a nice option to have. And then advanced camera reset, um, Splatoon doesn't just reset the camera vertically when you press the button. If you're moving, it moves the camera, flicks the camera around to face behind you, uh, your movement direction, so that you can um, turn around quickly. That's a cool option. I've added it to Fortnite as well. Still with that thing where you disable gyro while it's held, so you can still reset horizontally. Um, in Fortnite, we use the move stick direction. Splatoon uses your movement direction. So your inertia affects it, but move stick direction better affects your intent. So I think that's an improvement. And Fortnite, you can choose whether the button affects your pitch or both. Um, that's that. <laughs> you don't need to do everything. So for minimal effort, just do all of the basics. If you want minimalist settings and you don't mind putting in some extra effort, then um, do all the basics plus player space. Play space with a standard controller and um, local on handheld lets you skip having orientation settings if you really want to. You don't have to have sort of invert and choose your access options. And so that simplifies your options a bit. And also if you're a game like Breath of the Wild where you really only do all your aiming with a dedicated aim button, you don't need to use a gyro at all in any other circumstances. You don't even need the last two options as well. You don't need other ways to disable the gyro. But, <laughs> so you can have very simple options. But if you want to provide everything, Fortnite has like a simple menu and then a button that opens the advanced menu. That's a common practice in a lot of games. It's a good pattern here as well. And that's it. So um, we don't have time for questions. But there's also not another speaker coming next. So if you want to come and ask me questions anyway, I'm happy to stick around. I'd love to answer questions. Um, thank you for letting me power through that.